I was raised um, in a strong black community that was um, a small kind of blip in a larger predominantly white space, which a lot of times was not very um, welcoming for people who look like me. But um, I was always um, told that, uh, you know, I am worthy. I belong in the spaces in which I am and that um, I am whole and I am enough. You are enough. Your listeners are enough. And I think that with we uh, take that intrinsic value that cannot be taken from us, regardless of how our work environments or our communities interact with us. And, and you, as long as you like, hold fast to that, I think that you'll have the, the confidence or at least the resilience to move forward and uh, create these safe, brave, brave spaces where they don't naturally exist. Repeat after me. I bring more than diversity. I bring irreplaceable perspectives. Hey friends, my name is Whitney and I'm the host of Impostrix Podcast, the show that validates professionals of color navigating imposter syndrome and racial toxicity in their career. Join us and be validated. You got this. Hey, and welcome back to Impostrix Podcast. I am looking forward to this conversation. I'm speaking today with Katrina, Dr. Katrina Gibson and how I kind of ran into Dr. Gibson is because I was on LinkedIn and somebody else had posted an article that Dr. Gibson wrote. And the title of the article is Black Women Don't Owe You Likeability. Um, and this article is about how Black women are cast as unlikable or aggressive. Um, and it's kind of how I took it was a kind of pigeonholing into the moment that we show our feelings or the moment that we set boundaries, we become angry, the angry Black woman stereotype, um, or we are expected to be the strong Black woman. Um, and so if we're not being the strong Black women, then we're angry. Um, and so I read the article and felt as though I needed to to get Dr. Gibson on the show. And so I am really excited to have you here. Um, if you would go ahead and introduce yourselves and tell me what, what identities do you bring to this conversation? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me and thank you for reading my article and allowing us to use your platform to really address this issue. So um, what led me to write this topic? <laughs> well, unfortunately, my lived, it was my lived experiences. Um, identif I identify as a Black African-American woman. It is a lens through which I see the world, through which I experience the world. And probably of greater significance, it is the lens through which the world experiences me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, while um, a lot of my identities, I think it's important to focus on the um, intersectionality of our identities, but I think particularly in the field of medicine where people who look like me are quite a rarity, Black women make up less than 3% of, uh, of physicians. And it definitely shapes how I see the world, how I interact with my patients and colleagues. And um, I think that uh, in addition to just being a marginalized um, member of this uh, community, I think that in addition to just bringing light to what that means, it also helps me bring a significant uh, point of view for my patients. It allows me to advocate for them in ways that maybe people who, even though their intentions are in the right place, just don't have that lived experience with which to advocate for their patients. So it's a complex sense of identities that um, led me to have these experiences that led me to write this article. Thank you. And so you're an ER doc, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. Awesome. And so one of the the fascinations that I have is your background also um, with having a master's in public health. And um, as I understand it, when you wrote this article, you were a fellow um, in a writing program, if you will. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that because I think um, – we as professionals and particularly professionals that hold a lot of power where like our professions themselves hold a lot of power people will listen to us as a lawyer as a doctor um i love to see when we kind of stretch outside of the circle if you will of 
you know, treating patients um, to be able to mm-hmm. learn, teach, engage with people on other issues that are important. And, you know, we may get into later how racism affects our physical health, um, which I'm sure you have a lot of uh, experience researching, but I'm interested to know how you got into um, writing in this way, um, how that became a part of your your work. Sure. So I arrived at this stage in my career through, I think it's multifactorial. First of all, I, like a lot of people in healthcare, were just extremely burned out and frustrated um, during and after the pandemic, particularly working on the front lines. For us, these are, we were able to see when I say we, I mean the collective, uh, you know, um, American citizenship, because for those of us within healthcare, we knew about overcrowding in hospitals, people being underinsured and uninsured, and all the social drivers of health that cause people to end up in the emergency department when perhaps they might be better served in a primary care doctor's office. However, with the pandemic, I think that this um, led a lot of things to kind of the front lines. These are things that were not just being targeted toward a niche audience for people who were in healthcare and your healthcare adjacent, you could turn on your television, regardless of um, you know, your, your platform of interest. We're talking about healthcare, we're talking about uh, pandemics, we're talking about the social dr- drivers of health, we're talking about gun violence, we're talking about racism, and we're having these conversations within the context of it being a public health crisis. And for some of us, this was a new slant on which to look at these things. Gun violence isn't something that, you know, maybe it's just pigeonholed in certain um, environments as, uh, as the media would like us to think. We're all affected by this, regardless of your race, your class, um, your, your gender, where you live. This is a public health crisis. And organizations started talking about this um, in that context. For me personally, I've always loved to write, but I think that being a physician and I felt like I was always having to choose between the way in which I write, like, you know, no, only so many people are reading New England Journal and um, these these kind of um, Ivy Tower type um, publications. So for me, I became a Public Voices Fellow of Academy Health in partnership with the Op-Ed Project. And the Op-Ed Project partners with a lot of organizations, but their main focus and their goal is to to write to change the world and to give platforms to people who normally don't have a voice. If you were to you know, read editorials and, um, and, and other uh, major platforms, all, a lot of those, that slash the vast majority of these publications are being written and edited by white men. And of course, everyone has something to say. Everyone's experiences are unique, but white men are only a small percentage of the citizenship this, of the community. And it's about time that we start to pivot and make sure that all of our voices are being heard. And for me, this was an excellent way for me to say things that I may not be able to say in the context of a research journal. And it really uh, placed a value on the fact that my lived experiences are valid. I know that the uh, experiences that I'm having are real. A lot of times we try to gaslight people and, and tell them, you know, race doesn't exist. Racism doesn't exist. You know, this was just this isolated incident. And we know that that is not true. So I took this opportunity to use my lived experiences to amplify not only you know the, the microaggressions and the racism that I experienced as a Black female physician, but it also gave me the opportunity to give light and to give voice to the experiences that people of color have when they interface with the medical field. You know, I, I mentioned uh, gaslighting as a, as a powerful tool. Um, and I think that um, when we think about uh, medical racism, a lot of people might focus on one or two cases like Tuskegee Airmen, Henrietta Lacks, those are things that happened long ago and they don't affect us. However, that's simply not true. To this day, um, people of color, marginalized populations have very different experiences with the healthcare system and that leads to inequitable healthcare outcomes. So for me, I look at health equity as a form and a tool of social justice. And I think that uh, my words and anyone's words for that matter can transition into action which really has an impact on changed outcomes for, for, for all people who have to interface with not only the healthcare, but who are citizens in our, in our country who were all subject to, to these types of things, gun violence, healthcare inequities, and we're all affected by it. So this was an excellent opportunity for me to write, to use my voice to, to really, um, to make change, hopefully, is the, is the plan. Yeah, you said a lot there that triggered for me, like, just memories 
um, or like familiarity experiences with exactly what you're talking about. And, you know, one of the things in season one, I had on multiple guests, some who were um, academics, some who were like practicing in their in their fields, doing the thing that they do. Um, but all mm-hmm. of them talked about kind of the one, the barrier to writing in academics and to our voices being heard um, in the ivory tower, if you will, um, as far as getting into journals and writing, you know, for other researchers. And, you know, many of them talked about wanting their work to reach people like myself, um, the, the average consumer who wants to know this information and is not going to pick up a medical journal or a legal journal or a psych- psychiatric mm-hmm. journal or whatever the case may be. Um, and so I'm really, you know, I am personally finding the value in folks like yourself who can write in journals if you want to, um, and deciding instead that you want to use your voice in a way that is accessible to um, a broad group of people instead of, you know, a, a specific group of people. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, the other thing that you mentioned around medical racism um, reminded me of an experience that I had giving birth to one of my sons who, um mm-hmm. You know, the experience that I described to a friend of mine sounded like we had similar experiences, but in terms of what we presented to our labor and delivery room with um, and how she was treated Mm -hmm. was much different than how I was treated. And she's a white woman. I'm, of course, a black woman. Um, And what we focused on in our conversation that day was around our recovery and that I had to beg for pain medications. Um, and mm-hmm. she, they were just giving her the pills. Um, and I remember the nurse asking me, what is my pain level on a scale of one to 10? And I tell her that it's like a seven. And for me, seven mm-hmm. is, is bad. But she said, oh, well, we're just going to wait till it's a 10 then. And I remember feeling like, wait until it's a 10. So next time I just need to say it's a 10. If I'm only going to get pain meds at a 10, then I just need to say it's a 10. Like, why are we having to argue about whether or not I feel like I need something more than Tylenol or ibuprofen Mm -hmm. after I just pushed a child out of my body? Like, why are we having to have this conversation? Um, And I know a lot of people with similar experiences and those experiences until recently, like until the last couple of years, weren't experiences that I would have even been able to identify as medical racism Um, because Mm -hmm. one, maybe I'm just not talking to white people about their experience. Like I just, I go, I get my treatment and I assume that everybody's getting the same treatment. But two, there's been such a a push and I'm grateful for it to educate um, particularly black women down here in the South, as you know, around um, mortality rates for uh, mothers and children during birth and labor. Um, And so it's been, I've been keenly aware of it as someone who is in child rearing, child bearing age, um, and who has gone through the medical system here in Georgia uh, to have my kids. And it's, it is something that is very, very, very real that the more I'm talking Mm -hmm. with others about it, the more they're like, oh yeah, you want to hear what happened to me? This is what, you know, like, this stuff happens on a daily basis to people in my community. It's not absolutely it's not just Henrietta Lack. Like it's not just to Siggy Airman. And when we talk about communities of color having like trust issues with the medical mm-hmm. system, with hospitals, I still have people in my family that say, I'm not going to a hospital because I'm just going to come out with more problems than I came in with. Um, mm-hmm. Or I'm not going mm-hmm. to the hospital because I'm just going to get sick there. Or I'm not going to go to the hospital because they're not going to listen to me. And I'm just going to have to sit there for hours and hours and hours. I'm going to tell them what's wrong. They're not going to listen to me. They're going to send me home with some drugs that I don't even want. You know, and so it is it is very interesting. Um, and I love getting a, being able to have these conversations with doctors, um, particularly doctors of color, um, where we can talk frankly about what we're experiencing. Um, 
But to tie it back right. to the, the superhumanness of it, you know, for me, it was this feeling of if my pain on my scale is a seven out of 10, but on somebody else's scale, it's a 10 out of 10, then what I feel like is that you're telling me I can put it, I can deal with it. I can deal with that mm -hmm. pain, um, even though somebody else may not be able to deal with that pain. And so I don't get to have the support that somebody else might have. Um, right. And in your article, you wrote about the myth of the superhuman Black women um, dehumanizing us. And that was the mm -hmm. first time that I like put those two together um, yeah. in that way. And I think I've thought about it a lot as far as Black men go and particularly Black men in entertainment and sports mm -hmm. of like this, Black men are good for entertainment, but they're not good for anything else because they're dangerous now. Like the moment they leave the basketball court, they're dangerous. Um, but as far as women go, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it as far as it relates to women. And so that your article is one of the first times of like me thinking about those things together as as it relates to my identities as being a Black American woman. Well, you brought up a lot of uh, important points there that I think it's important to unpack. I'd like to start off by saying that I I hate that that was your experience with, and what should have been one of the most happiest, joyous uh, parts of your life. However, it's even worse that this is not an isolated experience and a lot of things that we need to remember. And, you know, you are an educated professional, you know, you have resources, things are even further um, complicated for women of color who, who may not have your education or your support system. But these are real experiences that uh, people who look like us have. And I think that this stems from the, the strong black woman stereotype as far as minimizing your pain. And this is not a new phenomenon. The whole strong black women, uh, a stereotype it stems from antebellum slavery there's the mammy the jezebel and the sapphire and it it has just integrated all aspects of our culture from you know entertainment uh, sports professionalism and that's the source so um l let's talk numbers i'm a physician i like i like i like numbers i like the i think that um you know it's meaningful um when it comes to maternal uh, mortality rates Black women are 2.6 times more likely to die in childbirth relative to our non-Hispanic white counterparts. We experience, um, for every 100,000 um, childbirths, 70 Black women die. And we're talking about the United States of America, a developed country that has access to all types of technology. So you're, you know, and... Um, this um, this resonates with me as well. We talk uh, Serena Williams, a you know world famous tennis player. She talks about how uh, her experience is when she was uh, in childbirth. No one believed her pain, her concerns. She was dismissed. So if we're talking about um, millionaires and people who have the um, access to you know all of the resources are not being believed, they're not being respected, their pain is being minimized. What does that say for the experience of the the average black woman who may not you know have access to the best doctors in the world, to the best hospitals, who may not have the the supported networks um, that others have? They're experiencing the same uh, types of things where where our pain is being dismissed, you know, um, and, and, and um, we, we keep mentioning that um, this really permeates all of the healthcare field. For instance, there was a study out of a University of Virginia not too long ago where they looked at um, residents and medical students' ideas about um, pain and how it's experienced. And this was um, just in the last, you know, five to seven years that there are medical students. We're not talking about the Proud Boys and KKK members, but actual medical students and educated people who believe that Black people experience pain differently. That our that our skin is thicker. That you know we're that we're you know not susceptible to the same type of pain that everyone else is. And I see this every day working in one of the busiest emergency departments in in the in, in the entire country. We're assumed that we're pain seeking. That we're tougher. That um you know that our our pain is not valid. And that is not true. Um, I think that um, when we started talking about the strong black woman maybe in the last several years or so is for the purposes of empowerment and, and just really emphasizing the resilience that one must have when you move through a world that was not meant for you, that does not validate you, and that does not support you. I think that the sentiments were important and that, you know, we do need to be resilient and whatnot. However, not to the extent to which it detracts from our humanity, from our ability to experience pain, 
and um, this these just unrealistic expectations of what it means to move through the world and look like us. We're not allowed to react. We're not allowed to respond in ways that um, fit the the microaggression or the the racism that we experience. But but we're supposed to be strong through it all. And um, like I said, I think that that um, it detracts from. Uh, the the complexity of our our identities it detracts from our experiences, but of greatest uh, concern is that it can be deadly when our pain is ignored, when our plights our place last in political uh, you know uh, movements. We we're human just like everyone else, and unfortunately, our uh, humanity is detracted from when others don't see it, when we're treated in different ways. But there are ways that we can can counteract that. And I think the first step is acknowledging that these things are real. And everyone has a vested interest in a healthier society and a more diverse society in a society where everybody's humanity is not only acknowledged, but 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 catered to and, and responded to in, in ways that have meaningful outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, bringing it into kind of the professional work environment. One of the reasons, like, mm-hmm. I kind of felt like my falling upon the article that you wrote was a little bit serendipitous or, or coincidental because I was going through a kind of pseudo review process at work, if you will. And at the same time, mm-hmm. somebody, one of my friends had sent me a, I think it was like a Twitter video, a social media video of a black woman uh, complaining or expressing the complaints of people that were in her immediate like online community. And this Mm -hmm. community was for black women of color, evidently. And many people were commenting in her community that they were getting feedback on their performance evaluations, that they weren't engaged or as engaged as their bosses felt like they should be or that they weren't as um, friendly as their their bosses felt like they should be, um, kind of tying that to customer service and using these types of, of terms. You know, for me, language around my tone and emails has been used mm-hmm. in, my, um, in my performance evals. And so, you know, I, I – reviewed this video and and this woman is just kind of like venting about how essentially it comes down to our likability and how our Mm -hmm. likability or, you know, how we're showing up today and whether or not we're making this environment comfortable for you, white person, um, winds up on our performance evaluation and winds up as a thing that we are being penalized for. And maybe now we're mm-hmm. not being considered for a promotion or we're not being considered for a lateral job change that we're interested in that may be um, public facing because we are not nice mm-hmm. enough, if you will, or we're too real or we are, what is it? One of my friends mentioned something recently that her boss told her that she's confrontational and her boss was viewing it as a good oh, thing. Yes, her boss yes. was like, why don't you go speak to this person? Because she's confrontational. She's not going to let you, you know, I, I don't know, do whatever you want. Or, you know, she's going to she's gonna help you. Her confrontationalness is going to help you. Um, and so it came at a time for me where I, you know, all of these messages were coming into me we're coming to me and I'm, and I'm personally experiencing it. Um, and so to see your article was so validating because I was like, yes, like, again, I didn't have the language to put all of these together quite like I'm now able to, um, and tie this back. Like I, I definitely knew, you know, and felt, especially when I'm being tone policed, the, the angry black woman trope (laughs) alive and well in my life. Um, but even, you know, thinking about the the strong Black woman and just the consequence of having boundaries, the consequence of not letting people walk all over us, the consequence mm-hmm. of demanding mm-hmm. respect, the consequence of having dignity, the, you know, the consequence of wanting to stand in our power is going to mean our performance evaluations might look different. Or, you know, we may be dinged for this where other people 
where where these types of characteristics, this boundary setting, this um, confrontation, this you know go getterness is celebrated in white men. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you and I may have received some of the uh, same uh, feedback, but. I mean, a, a lot of people who look like us, we, those adjectives, we're angry, we're aggressive, we're, you know, we're, we're confrontational. And um, it's almost, it's, it's so ridiculous. I actually got these uh, adjectives uh, placed on, on a shirt because people who look like you and I, like you said, we're not allowed to have boundaries. And, and one of the a civil rights that quote kind of resonates with me where they, you know, they say, because I've been in Atlanta for about five years now, but I was very much raised um, in the in the North and um, East Coast. So, you know, in the South, they don't care how close you get, as long as you don't get you know, too uppity. And up North, they don't care how uppity you get, as long as you don't get too close. And a lot of my professional experiences have resonated with that. For instance, um, as Black women, um, our, our environment interacts with us very differently and responds to us very differently. We are going to experience a disproportionate um, amount of microaggressions and racism, whether it be from patients, colleagues, customers, whomever the, the uh, population of interest may be. However, when we respond in kind, you know, the emphasis will be more so on our the nature of our response and our tone as opposed to the, the nature of the inciting racial microaggression. You know, um, and uh, you know, this is black women don't owe you like ability. I don't owe you uh, comfortability. You know, are you just because uh, you are intimidated does not mean that I am intimidating. So this article of interest that we're talking now about now stems directly from uh, a recent experience that I had at work. I, I referenced it briefly uh, in the article. I'm taking care of a critical care patient in trauma bay, probably about um, anywhere from six to 10 people in the room, pharmacists, resident physicians, nurses, et cetera. And um, one of my white male colleagues came into the room after I decided that we we're going to intubate or put a breathing tube down the, uh, the patient's uh, throat because they were deteriorating, came into the room and decided to, you know, look at any and everyone but me, the most senior uh, physician in the room, to decide whether or not my, my approach to this uh, taking care of the patient was, was appropriate. So I escalated the matter um, internally within the department. However, as I'm sitting in this meeting, not once um, did we discuss the racist uh, microaggression that uh, came about. The focus changed and we were talking about, you know, who felt uncomfortable in the room and, um, you know, what was said and how I said it. And, you know, um, I, I don't owe my oppressors comfort. Uh, it's not up to me to um, make them feel comfortable in their racism and their gender bias or whatever the ism may be. But not once did anyone say, you know, Katrina, I'm sorry that you experienced this. Like, how, how do you feel about this? What can we as leadership do to create safe and brave spaces in which people, um, A, are educated enough where they don't commit these microaggressions or when they do? And these are all things that um, we experience regardless of what our profession may be or what our experiences are, that when we as Black women set these boundaries and standards and have the, the space and, dare I say, the audacity to stick up for ourselves, we are the ones who are, you know, in the line of fire for uh, discipline, for, you know, for, for backlash. And that just can't be the case anymore. And if no one else is um, willing to talk about it and write about it, it's, it's going to be us because so many people benefit from the, the status quo and from patriarchy and white supremacy. And it's so ingrained in us that it affects all of us, even um, people of color, because that's how we are socialized. But um, these types of experiences are real, um, and when and when Black women um, set these types of boundaries and we're willing to stick up for ourselves, I think there's a recent article in the um, Harvard uh, Business Review that shows that when we have these experiences and respond in kind, um, it's it's more of a reflection of uh, as who we are as an individual, regardless of how appropriate the response was, if it um, fit the the initial aggression. It's going to be a reflection on me as an individual and my personality, and I'm combative, and I'm upset, and I'm angry, and it's completely taken out of context for the the system and the individual that felt so emboldened to completely disrespect and or disregard my medical decision making, or to you know to to use a slur, whatever the case may be. But it's always uh, you know we have to hyper analyze how we responded and if we responded, and then somebody feel uncomfortable and. But if you're not willing to feel uncomfortable, then you are not willing to grow. And if you want to stay in the same place that you are, then you're going to get left behind. Yeah, that's right. I was thinking about, as you were talking, 
a, a situation that I had in a workplace once where um, my supervisor, who was a white woman, went off on me, yelled at mm-hmm. me, arms waving, very dramatic in front of some other people around a decision that I mm-hmm. had that I had made. Um, and she came back to apologize, which was great. She came back to apologize and acknowledged, you know, the wrong that that had happened. But I, I just remember feeling like if I did that, like mm. <laughs> I would have been at least on probation, maybe fired, but at least mm-hmm. on probation. Um, and, you know, the people around me would have you know, written to their supervisors or whoever, like it wouldn't have just ended with her apologizing. She would have gone to HR or something. Like for me, I didn't even think about it. Like I was at a point where like, it didn't even occur to me to go to HR about how she had treated me at that point. Um, Mm -hmm. But like, we are not given that same kind of deference and that same kind of grace of like, this was a bad moment and it's not okay. Uh, and it was a bad moment. Um, because yeah, if that were me, then it'd be over. Like it, it'd be over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Immediately. And it's funny you mentioned that because I think that, um, as black people, we do realize that the consequences are different. It's almost as if for the same reasons why, um, you may not uh, bring a, an issue to HR. It's some of the same reasons why we don't feel comfortable calling the police. Regardless if we are victims in a situation, we know that um, due to our identities, we are going to be uh, hyper scrutinized. Some of the issues that I uh, referenced before the, um, that I experienced uh, in, in work just more recently, because this is a this is a daily thing. So I kind of have to choose my battles as to just for the purposes of protecting my peace. But um, just kind of maybe for my own experimentation, I started you know reporting these incidents. And um, I think that um, uh, the people who, who committed said incident, whether it be a, a, f- a fellow, a resident physician, um, staff working at the, at the hospital, you know, they were loud and proud with their public disrespect towards me. But then when they realized, you know, maybe, oh, it's she's an attending physician or someone of a, of a consequence, then all of a sudden, you know, they were intimidated by me is what I was told. And I mean, at the, the commitment to cognitive dissonance in these situations is real. There was zero intimidation when you were disrespecting me and treating me with complete utter disregard in front of a room full of people. But when they realized that there may be some sort of consequences for their actions, then all of a sudden they revert back to their, I'm intimidating and I'm confrontational and I'm aggressive. And I was like, if that were the case, I feel like we would not be sitting here. And um, I think that, you know, you, you mentioned this earlier that um, black men are often pigeoned hold as being big, scary, and angry, but here I am, I'm 5'3", but now all of a sudden everyone's scared and intimidated by me. And um, it, it's just it's just the commitment to the lack of accountability and the cognitive dissonance because we all know the power of, of uh, circumscribing Black women in professional and personal spaces and knowing that our actions and reactions and emotions are policed much differently than anyone else. I know that um, uh, it is expected that I show up in ways that make other people feel good about themselves. And I am not allowed to make anybody else feel uncomfortable. And if I do, then I need to be willing to accept those circumstances or those uh, or the repercussions of, of said actions. And as I get older and progress in my career, then I, I might be a little bit better placed to be the recipient of said repercussions. But I realize that, you know, for maybe my resident positions, for my medical students or people in other fields, that that may not be the case. So one of the ways that I um, attempt to to model for my my trainees is I show up as my authentic self every single day. My professional authentic self, let's be honest, that there's a, you know, there's a, there's a difference in how you may operate in your personal and professional life. However, um, when I have these conversations with people or when I attempt to hold people accountable, um, I realize that it's not just for the purposes of me. Um, I know that um, for me, being a Black woman, and if I just had this conversation with this one um, other physician or, or patient, then maybe it makes it that much easier for my medical student or my resident physician who may not feel supported and or confident enough to do that. And um, this fear is real. And I think it's important that we acknowledge this because there are repercussions for people who look like us that don't exist for other people, not only because they're not having the same types of um, experiences, but when they do, you know that um, the expectation is different for other people when it comes to 
what professionalism is. Um, a lot of people write about this most recently. Um, I was reading the uh, you know UCLA Law Review. Leah Goodridge talks about professionalism is a is a racist construct, and um, you know people who look like us we're told that. The way that our hair grows out of our head naturally is unprofessional, um, hence the crown hat. You know, uh, uh, black women um, in particular, or people with curly and or coarse hair, we've been made to feel that we need to straighten our hair with heat and or, and or chemicals. And now we're starting to see the, uh, the downturn effects of that, like increased rates of cancer, just because we are told that whether it's the way we speak, the way we look, the way we present, is not professional simply because of who and what we are. And um, it's time that we start change, start changing the narrative, both professionally and media, because this is, this is the patriarchy. This is white supremacy. We're all affected by it. And it's not just enough to be, you know, to, to not be racist and to attempt to be an ally. You need to be anti-racist, regardless of, of uh, what that means for you in your personal life and your professional life. These are our continual acts and a mindset that we must choose in order to make workplaces, um, reflections of people of color and media and on the news more inclusive and more equitable because um, a passive approach um, or no approach is not acceptable. And I think the first step is, you know, simply acknowledging the fact that these experiences are real. They have real outcomes for real people, whether it be um, worsening health outcomes, lack of uh, representation on the news and social, me and, uh, social media and education. These are things that affect people and have real outcomes. Yeah, you're right. Um, I was thinking about just, you, you mentioned showing up uh, to your workplace as authentic as possible. Um, and that's something that I also tried to do um, for myself, but also for the people around me who mm -hmm. weren't comfortable coming to the workplace with their full selves or, you know, as authentically as they may have liked. Um, and I, I hope that having someone around them when they went to work who did show up in that way was helpful for them. Um, I'll also say that I've been in situations where I'm showing up authentically and and speaking my truth and standing up for myself and I turn around and there's no one there supporting me um mm -hmm. people will say that they are allies they will say that they support me they will say that they're grateful for me speaking up or me saying this or me saying that um but there's a there's a difference you know like when when mm -hmm. you don't got skin in the game and so one of the things that you yeah. and I talked about pre-recording is this idea of like allyship versus, you know, acting in solidarity. And I think that for folks that are listening, um, everyone, not just white people, because the thing is, as people of color, as women, we're still needed to be in solidarity mm -hmm. with people who are experiencing stuff in the workplace. And so... For me, one of the most helpful things as the person who is going to say something is to have support, mm -hmm. like have backup, have someone yes. who can witness this, who can, you know, show up and and second my concern when I'm raising it in a in a meeting. Um, because otherwise, what I experienced is that I just turn into that person. I just turn right. into the person that needs to be managed instead of the issue needs to be addressed instead of mm -hmm. like, this is a systemic issue. It turns into an individual thing. And I think that's how um, systems of white supremacy can perpetuate in our workplaces is when people in leadership have the opportunity to write it off as a single person's problem. Um, and right. so, you know, that's what I would say for, for folks who are listening, if you're listening to this and you're, you're asking yourself, okay, so like, what, what do I do for myself and for others to help start changing the narr narrative of the angry black woman and the strong black woman? And, um, you know, what, what is my role in doing this? And if you're somebody that doesn't mm -hmm. think that you can show up and do these things like for yourself then maybe a good first place to start is doing it for somebody else is, you know, somebody raises their hand in a board meeting and they say, well, 
you know, I, I witnessed this happen and I felt some kind of way about it. Even if they don't use the perfect language, then a great opportunity yeah. for you is to say, oh yeah, I, I saw that too. And I had questions about that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I say this all the time, you know, to this, it'd be so much easier to pretend as if this is a Katrina issue as opposed to a systemic issue, because then we don't have to start sitting back and reflecting and changing the culture. Um, uh, you know, and a lot of reasons that people don't speak up either because some people, you know, I'm not making the argument that they, they don't care. Some people, you know, they just realize that um, there may be no change or there's, you know, nobody wants to be seen as the squeaky wheel. But, you know, after a certain point, um, you, you can't just send the message after the meeting. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm so glad you said something. I was just too scared to speak up. You know what? Well, we have fear, too. Once again, you know, we're not just the strong black women. Um, this adversely affects me, too. I'm a human being. It affects me um, emotionally, uh, mentally and physically to feel perpetually under attack in professional spaces without the type of support that I think should um, that I should be met with. But um Allyship is, uh, I say, is more than a stick on a badge. You know, but I think with uh, the pandemic, a lot of us started wearing like the, you know, the black power fist and we had the rainbow flag. That's nice. That's the first step. It can make people feel comfortable to make people feel seen. But, um, you know, if you are not getting hit by the stones of being thrown at the group or which you uh, claim to be an ally, then you are not an ally. You need to be you need to be able to speak up. You need to understand that doing so will be met with some adversity and you are going to be uncomfortable. And I realize that everybody, you know, has different stakes and more to lose. However, if you're not comfortable and you're have been unscathed throughout this process, regardless of, you know, your heart being in the right place or not, you're you're simply not uh, an ally. And I think that when we talk about these things, it's important to place an emphasis on action. You know, it's one thing to talk about these things. I think that it's cathartic. It it builds community. It um, particularly and when some of us are in, in communities where they're, we're the lonely only and we're made to feel that, you know, you're all of this is in your head. It's not real. And I think that these these conversations are important, but I think it's even more important to meet these conversations with uh, with action. And um, people know that representation matters or else DEI would not be under attack. Certain books would not be under attack. The far right would not be attempting to take away opportunity from people of color and women and um, other marginalized communities. So we know that these things matter because they don't want us to have access to these things. I think that... Um, Protecting DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion is, of course, um, as a step. However, um, per a, a study in 2022, 63% of DEI leadership uh, are white women. Now, and I think that, you know, all people have um, a space and voice in this uh, collective conversation. But if even DEI is not reflective of the diversity that we're attempting to, to propagate in education, um, professional uh, and professionalism, then we're missing the mark. Um, I think that um, DEI should represent the, the, the leadership and the initiative should be led and run by people who experience the racism, the microaggressions, the gender bias, et cetera. So I think we need to look at who is in DEI, what DEI means. It's more than about just race. And, and gender, it's about socioeconomic status, it's about able-bodiedness, it's about sexual orientation. And these are things that, um, you know, various legislators are attempting to make it even more difficult to talk about. Because when you know better, you do better. So if we don't have the knowledge of these experiences, the historical ideology of all these stereotypes, we talked about it leading back to, to um to slavery and, and, and the fact that, you know, this whole uh, racism in medicine isn't something that began and ended in the past. And it's something that manifest continues to manifest itself as ways like slaves were used as, as basically guinea pigs and study subjects. And still we as people of color experience diff have different experiences with the healthcare field that results in poor outcomes, um, increased mor morbidity, increased mortality. These things are real. And I think that having representation in education and looking into what DEI programs mean, both in the private and public sector, are going to be the things that make these conversations possible. It brings the appropriate people in, into, into the room. And um, for me, as, as a medical professional, I think that you know issues such as DEI are just as important as uh, other topics such as cardiovascular health, as, um, you know, as a their nephrology or renal health, people who are going into these fields need to learn about it to have improved healthcare outcomes. But if there's no one in the room with um, skin in the game who recognizes the links between all these types of issues, then we're going to continue to produce uh, physicians and nurses and healthcare providers that think that, you know, Black people have 
uh, thicker skin and, and experience pain differently. We're going to continue to see um, increased in mor uh, morbidity and mortality for Black women in childcare. And these are the things that we need to discuss. It's the social drivers of hell. It's the ideology of the racism and the discrimination and microaggressions. And we, if we're not talking about these things, then we're going to continue to turn a blind eye to the individuals, organizations, and legislators who are attempting to take out all of the tools that we're using so that um, health uh, equity can be a tool of, of social justice. So we've got to we've got to keep ourselves educated. We've got to make sure that the appropriate people are in the room when these conversations are being had, and that not only are appropriate voices in the room, but they're being heard and being respected and being trusted. Yeah, and I think like the one space where I might depart from you a little bit is in being, um, you know, DEI folks, DEI directors needing to be folks of color or other marginalized people. Now, I do well, I do think they need to be marginalized, um, but not necessarily by race. And I think that the reason I say this is because I think that racial justice work, equity work, anti-racism work requires white people. And it requires white men mm -hmm. and it requires white women and it requires people with power because what we're seeing is that, and what we've seen forever, is that people of color don't have the power all the time to be able to make the change that they want to see. And sometimes we need a conduit. And sometimes that conduit needs to be somebody that other people will respond to. If it's not me, then you can be it type of thing. Um, and what you're saying about making sure that voices of people impacted are heard, I think is so important because I don't think, and what I don't want to see is a white DEI leader doing this by themselves um, because mm -hmm. I don't have the faith in the experience of a white person to be able to do this by themselves. I don't have the faith that that person knows enough about what the experience is. Um, and I'm I'm really glad to say that the people that I'm close with, the white people that I'm close with that are in the DEI space, never do DEI work by themselves. They they don't mm -hmm. do training, they don't do audits, they don't do stuff like that. Um, they don't take money from organizations to do work by themselves because they acknowledge mm -hmm. where they're at. They acknowledge the privilege. They acknowledge that they don't have all the answers inherently from a sense of having experience. Uh, I think that's really important mm -hmm. in this work in terms of the humility and the self-honesty um, that's required mm -hmm. for us to move forward um, as anti-racists, white or, you know, any other race. Oh, of course. I think that a lot of times in these spaces where we're preaching to the choir, the people who need to be in the rooms and having these conversations and subject to the training, they're not in the room. Because I think a lot of times in an academia and medicine, DEI is not seen as scholarship. It's not seen as worthy as other um, aspects of care. And, and of course, you know, I speak mm -hmm. from a place of medicine that it's just not it's not valued um, for as, or as a valid um, form of scholarship. And I think that um, if you show me how people use their time and or their money, you show me their value. So it shouldn't be something that's, you know, kind of, uh, if you have time, you know, watch this video or come to this talk, because once again, that's going to be a self-selecting uh, group of folks that come and likely those who don't necessarily need to hear the the message. So just like uh, medical students need to learn about, you know, um, cardiovascular health, um, GI, digestive stuff, they need to learn about EEI, particularly when you work with marginalized populations. Like I work in uh, downtown Atlanta. If you're prescribing a medication that your patient cannot afford, then um, are you really making any sort of change? Or is, instead of writing in your chart that your patient is non-compliant and or not adherent and they don't show up to their appointments, why is that? Maybe you know the bus lines and or other forms of public transportation don't go to their neighborhoods. Maybe they don't have transportation. So um, I think that uh, once we in academia start uh, valuing uh, DEI and making sure that it's infused into all other aspects of our um, of our training and making sure that this is promotionable work as well. I know that no, uh, those of us, um, you know, that really resonates with those of us in academia. There's the minority tax. We're the ones who are sitting on the panels and doing the work and doing the writing. But if it's not seen as true scholarship or something that's promotional, it's uh, something that we're invested in and needs to be done. But it also contributes to the fact where you felt that your environment and 
your uh, community does not value the work that you're doing and or the experiences that you have. So I completely agree. I think in order for DEI to be successful and impactful, all folks must be involved, um, particularly those who may not be directly impacted by the lack of DEI. Those are the people that we need uh, at the table who are willing to listen, who aren't going to be defensive, and who aren't going to feel as if that they're going to experience some sort of a backlash for being in this room and being at this table. And I think that our work needs to be valued. It needs to be promotional. It needs to be funded. I was, yep, I was just gonna say and funded. <laughs> it need there needs to be money, okay? Because that's when that's when we're talking about the non-promotable work or the the work that you say is valued but isn't really valued because we're actually not getting paid anymore or we're not getting paid period or we're, you know. So, okay, we're going to wrap up this conversation, but before we do, um I'm going to ask you mm-hmm. one more question and before I ask you that question, I would love if you could share with us how we can find you, how we can follow you. Um, or interact with with you and your work? Excellent. So um, I, I share most of my work on uh, LinkedIn. You all can find me at Katrina, like the hurricane, Gibson, G-I-P as in Peter, S-O-N-M-B-M-P-H. And you can see a lot of my op-eds, some of my uh, podcasts and radio shows, and there will be more to come, additional ways to find me. Um, I just really enjoy bringing light to these difficult topics and really embracing, you know, being comfortable with being uncomfortable if we really want to be the people in society that we say that we want to be. It's going to take some work. It's going to, some tears maybe shed, um, some feelings maybe hurt. But I think that if we're all focused on the greater good and making sure that we acknowledge all people's uh, humanity and, and um, that those are the steps that it's going to take to get to where we need to be. Right. Absolutely. Um, and the name of Katrina's article, I'm going to make sure to put it in the show notes, but it's Black Women Don't Owe You Likeability. And where am I reading it? It's in the Boston Globe is where I'm reading it. Mm-hmm. So the last question that I have for you, and this is a new tradition that I'm starting for season two. Um, and that's what I, I would love to know during the times where you need a lift me up, where you need to feel more confident, to feel more power, to walk in your power? What is the affirmation or the mantra that you rely on? Mm, That's an excellent question. Um, I I think there are a few. My mom is uh, someone, she always sends me, you know, like these books of affirmations, but I just really rely on my community. I was raised um, in a strong Black community that was um, a small kind of Live in a larger, predominantly white space, which a lot of times was not very um, welcoming for people who look like me. But um, I was always um, told that, um, you know, I am worthy, I belong in the spaces in which I am, and that um, I am whole and I am enough. You are enough, your listeners are enough. And I think that with we uh, take that intrinsic value that cannot be taken from us, regardless of how our work environments or our communities interact with us. And, and you, as long as you like, hold fast to that, I think that you'll have the, the confidence or at least the resilience to move forward and uh, create these safe, brave, brave spaces where they don't naturally exist. You're yeah. enough. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Episodes that I would encourage folks to listen to are episode 10 with Nagar Fani, um, because in that episode, we're talking a lot about the impact of racial trauma that we're experiencing in the workplace and beyond, the impact that that has on our brains. And I think it's a really interesting like segue from, from this conversation that we're having. Um, and then also episode 15, we talk a lot about this concept of promotable and non-promotable work um, and mm-hmm. how much work we take on as folks of color, as folks who are interested in anti-racism um, without experiencing um, any kind of like benefit in terms of professional um, development, if you will, or professional acknowledgement, mm-hmm. professional um, promotions. And so I think those, right. <laughs> you know, those two conversations are are great conversations for for you to listen to, um, listeners who want to hear more about some of these um, topics that we talked about today. So thank you again, Dr. Gibson, for joining us on Impostrix Podcast. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for joining me for this conversation. I hope that you got as much out of it as I did. 
feel free to continue the conversation with us over on Facebook at the Impostrix Podcast Validating Space. We welcome all, and it's a space for us to validate each other as we work through work, race, and imposter syndrome. You can find out more about me or about the podcast at www.impostrixpodcast.com. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Podcast. Until next time, be validated.